So, Anand um, from South Africa, he is the CEO of uh, Mixit, which is, as you guys probably already read the description, uh, Africa's largest mobile social network. He is mobile network, social network program. Okay. So, Anand's here just for three days and he's leaving tonight, <coughs> and he's uh, been gracious enough to say, very good to come over and uh, talk to us. The two slides are here, it's just going to be a conversation about the story of Mixit, how it came to me. Uh, Alex, you, you are not the founder, right? You are part of the company. So, thank you. Hello, yeah. Can you do it, sir? Go back to sit. No, it's standing in square. Thanks. So, thanks for the uh, invitation. It's very nice to be here. It's my second time in Bangalore. So, um, I guess. The reason uh, I was asked is to maybe explain a little bit about how uh, Mixit, which is a South African company, and I've got the magic right when it came to building community across you know, feature phones all over smartphones in an African context. So I'm going to take you a little bit back. Um, I'll, I'll just put you in the picture. I'll say uh, you know what is how we how we got to the Mixit story, and then I'll tell you about exactly how Mixit built itself. So it doesn't take too long. And then I'll also tell you about some of the insights we've had since we've taken over. So as I as I as Karen has said, I, I didn't start Mixit. I've got a company called World of Avatar, which uh, has a number of companies doing kind of mobile apps for Africa, consumer facing, specializing in dumb phones. So we don't we don't think that everybody at least in where where I live Nobody's got a smartphone, uh, unless you bought a BlackBerry smartphone. And if BlackBerry is a smartphone, then about 10% of the population is a smartphone. The rest is uh, feature phones, and and it's not just that that's the market. You know, 70 to 85% of all phones being sold every single month in South Africa, which is at the head of the rest of the continent, are still feature phones. So, long, long way away from uh, Android and iPhone and you know, Windows Phone penetration. So. We focus on types of apps that can be across, all across the phone, selling at the bottom of the pyramid all the way at the top. Um, we came across Mixit about uh, a year ago, uh, well, 10 months ago. So in South Africa, Mixit is quite a famous company. It uh, was a very successful, obviously, it became quite successful. To put it in context, Mixit has about 55 million uh, registered customers in about 126 countries. Um, it makes most of its money through selling content, so it's an instant messaging application. But people can, you know, they, they chat for free, effectively free SMS or free text. But uh, you know, when you're in there, you can also go and buy music or wallpapers or games or things like that. So about 70% of the business revenue is actually generated through lots of microtransactions. Um, you know, just to you know, put it in context, the, the type of people that, that use an application like Mixit are under the age of 30, and they um, are incredibly engaged. So the average active Mixed user spends eight hours a day in Mixed plugged in. Um, the messages, I mean, we're talking about like a lot of messages now, so I mean, of course, this is not this is not Twitter, but to put it in context, uh, Twitter does, I think last, two weeks ago, they released the stats saying they're doing about 400 million messages a day globally in Twitter. And Mixed, we do between 550 and 850 million messages every single day. And, uh, and if you include on top of that content purchases, so the tickets for content, it does about 1.4 billion transactions every single day. All South African software, uh, all developed kind of in Stellenbosch. And uh, so it's quite well known. A lot of these stats weren't known in South Africa. It was only when I got into the due diligence that I learned about some of these little secrets. So, you know, I was kind of minding my own business, and then I heard that um, the shareholders of Mixit, there were two shareholders, the founder, a guy called Herman Hens, and a big media conglomerate called Nuspass, who actually own 30% of Tencent in China as well. Um, they had a bit of a falling out, the shareholder. Uh, any, anybody here, uh, own their own company? A couple of them? Do you, uh, you have outside shareholders? Not yet. Just, it's like getting married, so you must be careful. Before you choose uh, somebody just for the money, you know, if you don't, have, if you don't get along, you know, you're going to get divorced, and that's what happened. Yeah, um, they got into bed about six years ago, um, and uh, you know, had a bit of a 
on to his time, and in the end, you could see that it just wasn't working. So we stepped into that vacuum, we did a due diligence, and we bought Wingsuit uh, in its entirety from both of these guys. And subsequent to that, uh, I found it to be an amazing story. Firstly, nobody really has known the story, but the founders of Wingsuit were very paranoid, um, mainly because they had to be, because when Wingsuit started, it was very, very, uh, you know, the telcos didn't really like it. Because it was analyzing their SMS and text revenue. So it's, it's a classic ODT service over the top. It's like Skype, but it's just for SMS. And so they had to be pairing with it and tell anybody anything. And that kind of philosophy all went through. So, you know, yeah, they obviously survived that whole period, but their story never got up. So when we did the due diligence, the government control, we saw, okay, this is a story. And, you know, regardless of what happens with me and my crew going forward, I mean, if we do destroy this thing, then that's what happens, but at least there was some success up until now. And then we uh, we actually decided to write a book about the whole thing as an example of what can happen in an African context, especially around using mobile applications and 3G. So, next it started in 2005. Um, just to put it in context, South Africa had ubiquitous 3G networks from 2003, so complete coverage everywhere. Uh, so, in late 2004, a couple of guys. Uh, Marion and Manus Freeman. Um, they were in their uh, probably late thirties. They had children and everything. They were sitting in the bar one day and thought, "Hey, how, how can we make an app that people can use?" And they and they they thought, "Well, maybe it's really cool for people to be able to chat for free, and then maybe they can write some kind of J2ME app that you can download onto these old feature phones." So they did, um, and, and this thing kind of for some reason caught on in a very low income community outside of Cape Town. I don't think it was been to Cape Town, but outside of Cape Town uh, there's a, a township called Cape Flats. And uh, it's probably it's, it's definitely one of the most dangerous places in the world. And it's definitely one of the first places in the world. But makes it for some reason caught on in the high schools in the Cape Flats. And the kids were using it to kind of protect some stuff. And uh, the reason I mean, one of the reasons it kind of caught on it was quite difficult to get it onto your phone. So only the cool kids had figured out how to put it onto their phone, and you weren't cool unless you knew how to get it on your phone. And obviously, you weren't cool if you weren't chatting to your friends on Nixon and all that. So there was a little bit of a funny element there. And most people think the, hot, the easier you make things, the better chance it has an adoption. And it just lost people. But it doesn't, you know, sometimes it's that kind of funny angle. And that's what kind of gave it its coolness capture. Um, the, I mean, just, just to picture it, I don't know if you guys from, I'm assuming most of you have a smartphone, but the old Nokia phones, which are still the vast majority of phones, are, you know, push the menu, there we go, we've got some other dancing poor people there. Um, you push the menu and it goes messages and you down and goes call settings and register and all that stuff, and then you would literally go to the web option. You can't really see anything on the web, but if you download, if you type m.mixer.com, would say, would you like to download Mixit? You would click download, and the next time you went through your settings, you'd actually see Mixit as one of your settings, like messages, call register, Mixit, and then you'd go into the little Mixit. So it started there, um, but they started having problems. They saw that when people downloaded Mixit, uh, they would go in, and they would look for somebody to talk to, but if there was nobody online, they would leave the room and wouldn't come back. Uh, Mixit is a, is a synchronous social network. So unlike Facebook, which is asynchronous, you go to Facebook to catch up on your photos and the lives of your friends and family. Mixit, you're going there for a real-time conversation. If you can't talk to anyone, you leave. So how would they get the critical mass? I mean, how do you kind of get to the chicken and egg situation? If there's no one in the room, you don't want to go to the room. Nobody goes to the room. in the room. So the Mixit guys created a, artificial, a little uh, artificial intelligent bot called Lucy which became an automatic friend. So as soon as you download it, Mixit, you, you always had this automatic friend who was online all the time. And it was just a machine. And you'd say, hi, Lucy. And Lucy was like, hi, how are you? Fine. And you'd have this really, really stupid conversation back and forth with somebody who obviously was not human. And just these canned answers. But that kept people in the system for about 20, 25 minutes. And you know, once you were stuck in the system, somebody else would come into the room, and you could talk to that other person. But the real trick was when they introduced something called Foo. And Foo was uh, Lucy's like, dark, evil, alter ego. And uh, Foo would abuse you. So, you know, you'd hide Foo and she'd tell you to stuff with him. Uh, leave me alone. There was a lot of kind of abusive stuff and stuff. And it um, turns out people really like to be abused. So the average kind of person would spend about an hour and a half talking to Foo, being 
views. And part of the magic of Foo was that you, Foo wasn't an automatic friend. Um, so we really had to figure out how to add Foo. It was like tricky to kind of find her in the contact system and all that stuff. But, but of course, the kids in the high schools, they, you know, they would like to have you spoken to Foo. And they'd be like, no, oh, what's Foo? And they'd say, oh, you know, I'm not going to tell you. And the cool kids were the ones who knew how to find Foo in the system. That kind of got the vitality going. So it went to about 30,000 users in the cap labs within about six months. And it just jumped like a virus to uh, the Indian community of Durban. And from there, it went viral around the country. And after about 18 months, they had um, about a million customers. So that was pretty good. Uh, but they were running out of money. So the founder, Herman Hennis, who was you know, doing all money, and he said, look, guys, you have two months, and then we switch off the tax, because we just don't have any more money. You know? So um, there was a guy in, there was a guy inside who uh, he was a bit of a funny guy. Funny, I mean, he trained to be a pastor, a Christian pastor. Then he decided not to do that, so he became a magician for a while. And then he decided that wasn't for him, so then he became a shaman, the uh, Peruvian spent a lot of time in the room and drinks magic potions. And then he and he was a coder as well, so he figured out how to code. And this guy was one of the original techies there. And he said, well, why don't we create chat rooms? So the mix of the, the concept of the mix it was, you know, these person-to-person -person conversations for free. Um, but if you wanted to have, participate in a group conversation, they would, they would okay, we'll, we'll create chat rooms, you can participate in group conversations, but those messages you pay for. So they created, they would create, um, uh, they created a, a virtual currency called Muna, and uh, the way you got Muna is you'd send a premium rand SMS to the telco. Uh, so you'd send a two rand SMS to M10, and M10 would, and then that would credit your Muna for your Mixer ID for 200, so you get 200 Muna for two rand, and Mixer would get the revenue share of the telco. And then every time you sent a message into the chat room, it would take two Muna off. So it's a very small transaction. I mean, it's less than one one uh, one South African cent which is you know seven rand to one dollar. So it's a really small microtransaction. And you you know and so and it became self funding after two months. Um, and then today uh, there is just the chat room revenue. Like some lots and lots of small little transactions of less than one cent. Um, I think the total total in US dollars is about three million dollars a year that they generate out of that. But it's no cost of sale. It's just there's no cost of sale. Um, okay, and then and then we got some funding, and then you know Herman brought on us as partners, and then they kind of spent the next few years kind of growing and growing and growing. Um, I probably made a few mistakes along the way, but uh, you know the one thing I've learned, um, which maybe I'm a little slow to all these things. So when I started with all the Avatar, I thought, hey, we're going to start all these little mobile app companies. I mean, it's a no-brainer. There's no competition, and there's really not a lot of competition. It's like uh, you know, people who start so it can't be that hard to build the community. And a lot of that stuff just failed miserably. You know, so, you know, you, all the, we had enough money, we had clever guys, everybody was working hard enough, you know, you thought you were doing the right things, but it just couldn't get through. And I started realizing that a big chunk of all of this is just luck. If not 80%, it's just, just pure luck, timing, what I don't know what it was, but it's, it's not in your control. So that was, you know, when, when, we, when we finished this due diligence of mix and we understood the story of the whole thing, and you realize how much luck was involved. Like just, I mean, a lot of hard work, you know, which is credit, but you also have to look at this going, so this is like a miracle. Uh, I thought I'd rather, you know, spend a lot of money buying that luck <laughs> than spend a whole lot of money and pray that I get the luck at the same time. So that's where, uh, that's where Mixit got to. So Mixit, uh, I mean, in a sense, it's quite an interesting uh, phenomenon. Mm -hmm. it, it grows with between 25,000 and 50,000 new, new customers a day uh, all over the world. I mean, right now we're, we're seeing a spike in Syria. I'm not sure if it's related to what's going on in Syria. But uh, we have people signing in Tajikistan. We've got like a million or two million people in Mexico. I think Mexicans think it's Mexican because of MX. I think uh, there's some stuff happening in Indonesia. We've got about two and a half million customers in Indonesia. I don't even know what's going on. I can't understand what's going on because it's all in Indonesian and Spanish. So, kind of, quite a, quite a bizarre thing. And, um, and what's really cool about it is it doesn't rely on... Is this thing working? It doesn't, it doesn't rely on selling your data. So it's not an advertising-driven business model. About 30% of the revenue is advertising. 
but the vast majority is selling content to people who supposedly don't have any money. So it does monetize from low income communities and it has a model that there's no incentives there to go and take all your, your information, give it to somebody that may not tell you what they did with the information, which you know, may be the strategy of some companies in Silicon Valley. So, um, so what? The one interesting thing. Okay, so the one, how it actually works is you've got citizens in the country, and, uh, and, and, and the ruler, this, it was actually a stroke of genius, this kind of ruler digital currency, because it enables very small payments. That comes the money of the country, which enables the economy. And up until, uh, until we took over, a lot of the Mexican economy was very kind of parasitical like. Uh, countries that kind of build their own steel factories and own the national airlines and own the banks, you know, they don't open them up. Which uh, I think is quite necessary when you build these things to start with, because you need the content in the system. Nobody will build the content until the people come, and the people won't come until the content there. But it's, it's, a, it's a surefire recipe for being mediocre. And a lot of the content within this was mediocre because it was all kind of in-house. And the second problem with that is that uh, it's very difficult to get people to come in, come into your, uh, come into your, your economy if, if they're not sure that you're not going to compete with them on that. Okay, so uh, you know, people aren't going to come into your, think of it as telcos. The government has its own mobile operator and then goes and issues a couple of licenses for private cars. You know, the private cars think carefully before they take those licenses because they're it's not necessarily a level playing field. Um, so we've had to, we've completely changed that strategy and that's just a pure open API. Uh, taken a bit of a hit on the revenue because we've basically privatized a lot of the contents, like giving away the mix business, uh, the music business, giving away the chess business, all that stuff. And, uh, you know, rather just said, look, we're the government, we make sure the infrastructure is in place and we set the rules and stuff, um, and you guys go make the money and we tax you on the money that you make. So the whole business goes from trying to figure out how to make money to rather thinking about how to help other people make money. As long as other people are making money, we're making money. And, I, and it's actually quite a nice kind of thing, and, and then people don't worry what our incentives are and, and all of that. And keeping in mind that there's quite a lot of content that gets sold in this thing. These games are massive, games are These are simple phones with black and white screens and mostly text only, but there's over a million people playing a, a massively multiplayer online game called Moonless, where your job is to take over the moon and you can band together like a World of Warcraft, things like that. So it's very simple. The game dynamics are They've been tried and tested, but the fact that it works across all these different phones is quite powerful. Um, so, in an African context, uh, when developers, if you go to Lagos, or if you go to Kenya, or even in South Africa, the guys are faced with three massive challenges which actually makes it addresses. One of our biggest target markets is developers in Africa, local content developers. The first challenge they face is which operating system to develop for. So, if, uh, I'm talking Africa. There are no Android phones in Africa. Um, I mean, people keep telling us that they're Android phones, but there are none. There, there are definitely no iPhones. I mean, when I say none, it's you know, less, probably less than 300,000 iPhones. Um, there's no Windows phones yet. Uh, there's quite a lot of BlackBerry, a hell of a lot of BlackBerry. Actually, like in so for Nigeria, there's probably 15 million BlackBerry phones. In South Africa, there's probably seven million. So that's you know, there's quite a big market. You can develop for that. But the problem with the developers is they all think that Brim is going to go out of business. So people don't want to develop with a BlackBerry API just in case BlackBerry just doesn't exist one day, or the rules change, and there's a new owner. And so the uncertainty around what's happening with BlackBerry 
means there's not a lot of confidence in holding it at a few your business right there. And then, of course, there's the, the feature phones. And there's about 2,500 different feature phones in the market. And they all require a slightly different tweak when you, if you, if you write the J2ME at the least stage. So let's sort of address is that. When, we, when the guys write for the API, it gets published to all the different platforms, doesn't matter what device you're on. The second thing, which is a massive problem, is that most, most people don't have credit cards or bank accounts don't have. Um, in South Africa, we've, we've got a population of 50 million people, and we've got 1.6 million credit card holders. And we're like the richest country in Africa. So the rest of Africa is just no credit cards. So now, how do you build people when there's no way of taking money out of their account without seeing the person? Um, of course, you can use premium rate SMS. So the telcos are the major layer for building in this context. But the revenue shares aren't that generous. In South Africa, it's quite generous. You, on average, get about 60% of whatever you build. But in Nigeria, you get about 25%. So it's, you know, people can try to build businesses around that, but it's tricky. Now, because of, uh, because of the Mueller and the audience, we have quite a lot of negotiating power. And we get banks to integrate seamlessly into it, so for payments. So you can actually get EFT banks, things like that. You get uh, the telcos, we can negotiate better rates from the telcos to convert airtime into into water. And then we're working on agent models and plugging into microfinance schemes and all those kind of things. So the problem with monetization in Africa is that you can't hold people without being in front of them and taking cash out of them. Uh, somebody has to solve that problem. At least we have the capacity and the resources to solve that problem. And then the little developers, they definitely don't have that time and resource, they don't have to worry about it. Uh, we, all we're trying to do is reduce the cost of acquiring water. The lower the friction cost of acquiring water, the more money they're getting out of their revenue share so they can have their The third thing uh, for the guys is discovery. So how do you how do you you know make yourself uh, noticeable in your answer? Is the entire mobile web out there. So how do you get people to know about your service and your product? Now that's quite tricky because of course that means advertising, you know, or something. You have to get into the telcos, you have to broadcast through SMS or something. But now uh, Nexit is a curated shop. So it's, it is the internet, but it's curated. And of course that means it's far easier to find. And also because we're, we can target the audiences and stuff like that. The guys find it much easier. So recently we had this quite interesting story about uh, a company called No Tribe, based in Cape Town, and they were doing some third-party work for us um, on our vouching systems. And and as with most South African developers, they kind of thought Mixit was yesterday. You know, everybody must have a smartphone by now. You know, it's just like yesterday. And then they, whilst they were working with us, they would look at the system and go, "My goodness, this is quite big. This is much bigger than we thought." And uh, so they decided to write a small app. And it's, I mean, it's probably not going to save the world. But it was called Judge Me. So you would upload a photo of yourself, and then the people in the app would judge you, one out of ten. And then you go into a chat room, and you can chat to people and judge people, whatever you want to do. Yeah. And then, uh, and then, if you wanted to skip a photo, you have ten minutes to skip a photo you didn't want to rate. And if you wanted to message somebody whose photo you liked, um, a thousand minutes. It's basically a thinly veiled dating scheme. And uh, in the first two weeks, they had 250,000 photos uploaded. I think in two months, now, so just over two months, they've got 1.6 million active users, and we've had them a check of about $10,000 on their revenue share amount. And they, and they have been running these mobile web services for like three years now. It's just not getting any traction. They can't get users, and they can't get engaged users. One thing getting the user, but then they see like the guy just doesn't use it once they've used it for the first time. And that, that will then solve a lot of their problems. So they just stopped writing for the mobile web, really, because, and they stopped dealing with telcos and stuff. Okay, so there's a couple of uh, uh, really important things that I've seen uh, from the thing with it, now that I'm part of it. And definitely, I mean, I'm not necessarily the average person in Africa. So for me, they were quite insightful. The one is that. Um, People are incredibly sensitive to price or data. So it's just, it's just it's not feasible to give people Google Maps. It's just not the way it is right now, because it just eats so much of your data. And, you're, and you've got only so much in your prepaid account that you just can't afford. You're never going near that app because you're not sure what's being charged. And you have to be, you have to have 
very, very clear transparency. It has to be totally transparent what you're spending on your on your data book. Um, so that's very key. There was almost a mini revolution on the Mexican user base when on one of the version upgrades, they automatically updated your avatar, your profile photo, without asking to have it updated. And I think the average the average uh, spend for your on the air time bill was three rand. It went up for three rand, which was say, forty US cents. And people almost came and like killed killed the company. You know, there was there was a revolution. Because that's you know, it might not sound like a lot of money, but it was it was money. And, and the market was quite sensitive. The second thing uh, which is very uh, illuminating is that most people only have one device in their life. They've only got their phone. They don't have they don't actually have their own personal TV, they think they don't have their own personal TV. They don't have a PC or a laptop, they don't have an iPad, they don't have a PlayStation. So there's no other distraction. You know, that's the reason, although we've got a fraction of the number of users that Twitter has, we do double the number of messages that Twitter does because these people, most people, have that one device, they're not driving their own car to work, so they're actually sitting in the taxi or on the train or waiting at the uh, station, and they're killing time. And that device um, is their gateway to a whole new world, both through their friend networks, for meeting new people, for playing games, for listening to music, whatever. Very important, and that's why it's so massively engaged. And, and honestly, the, the, the worse the device, the more engaged the people are. The better the device, the more likely people are to have other devices. The last thing which was, for me, massively illuminating is uh, anonymity and the importance of anonymity. So, uh, we, I mean, my, my knee-jerk reaction to uh, anonymity has always been, it's, it's really for users, for people who can't put their name behind their their comments, right? Because you always go to these websites and you see the comment sections and you think to yourself, who are these people? Right? Racists, abusers, bigots. And they just, and they always hide behind these pseudonyms. So I just thought, you know, no, kind of just thought, you know, it's, you, if you can't put, uh, if you can't use your true identity online, then you've got something to hide. But then I saw what was happening inside Mixit. So, there are three kind of major things where anonymity plays a massive role, and which is why something like mix it took off. First thing is um, uh, one of the biggest applications for mix it is drug, alcohol, teenage pregnancy, uh, gangsterism, counseling. Um, so you know, so again in the cave flats, a lot of people have got tip habits like uh, um, I can't remember what's real names, like a drug habit. Or they you know, the 16-year-old girl is pregnant, or whatever it is, and there's no means for the, uh, in their communities for people to get help because sometimes the help's not available. So sometimes it's, it's really available, but you can't let your friends see you going into that, that social worker's office or anything like that. So you, you, the the power of anonymity gives them like a teenage girl who's 16, living in a Muslim family in the middle of their flats, who knows what's going to happen if her parents find out, but is desperate to find out what she should do now. Gives her a means of engaging with counselors that are sitting somewhere else through her phone and put it to her phone, and we can see what she's doing. And you know, obviously, at some point, get to the point where she reveals her true identity and goes and gets help. So, for anything like that, for whether you, you think you've got HIV, whether you think you, you know you're part of a gang and you're trying to get out of a gang, you don't know how to get out of a gang, uh, all of those things massively powerful. Without anonymity, you can't engage those people at all. Second thing, very important, uh, is for education. So there's, uh, about, there's, quite, there's a number of educational apps that run through the Mixit platform. Uh, one of the most successful ones are called Dr. Matt's. And about 38,000 uh, high school students in uh, low-income communities um, are, count, are given extra maths lessons by university students at the University of Victoria and uh, in the maths department. It was set up by an American professor, actually. She works for CSR in South Africa, and she thought there's a Maybe there's a way to connect kind of these clever students who want to make a difference, but that are geographically distant from kids that that need the extra help, um, and that kind of that's been enormously successful, especially when the teachers go on strike. And uh, and actually, one of the keys there was anonymity. So when you're sitting in your class, you don't put up your hand. You know, when the teacher says, "Does everybody understand what's going on?" You don't put up your hand. Around it. No, I don't understand. When one or two people that do do that are ostracised. <laughs> At least my school. So you know, everyone knows you don't like say you're stupid. You don't say you don't know what's going on, and then people get left behind in the class. Um, and and for me at least, then I could go home and I could read a book, catch up. I didn't have internet back then, but you know, 
got my parents, but you know, most of Africa you can't do that. So the fact that people have a means now of anonymously without losing face to their friends, kind of getting that advice and, and extra helping and learning, quite powerful. And even more interesting is that a lot of teachers use it. So if you think kids have peer group pressure when it comes to not looking stupid, teachers have really got peer group pressure. I mean, a teacher can't ask the parents for some help, you know. They definitely can't ask, ask the other teachers because the teachers like stop judging each other and kind of kids. So like they need the anonymity as well to kind of get ahead. So anonymity is very, um, very, very important for that. I think um, uh, a very big part of anonymity is uh, meeting people. So I'm not, I know in India there's some issues on this, but in South Africa there's proper issues. You know, we've got black, colored, Indian, white, Afrikaans, English. There's nine, uh, nine black tribal languages which are as divided as whites and blacks. So there's like lots of issues there. And uh, the anonymity, the fact that people within mix it, people know there's an avatar, you have a profile, but it's not necessarily that person. People can meet people without being judged. And most of the judging happens at a class level, you know, like rich, poor kind of thing. And sometimes at a religious level, so the Muslim versus Christian community. And uh, that layer, the fact that that gets taken away by the availability of pseudonyms and anonymity, means people get to know each other without judging a book class cover. And then when they get to the point where they know each other really well, they can meet, and they do meet. And we've got hundreds of case studies where people got married after meeting a mix of but people that you would never, ever, ever, ever think would get married. They would never have told you they would marry that person, but because they could get to the person behind the cover through the medium of the monarchy, that was kind of the key. I mean, I think the last thing to say about something like Mixit is that um, when you're kind of sitting in the bottom of the, of the food chain, you know, the bottom of the social uh, income pyramid, you know, you never, have, you never buy yourself. And so you go on the street, there's all the people in the street, you share a house with lots of people. You never ever alone, you never actually get to escape. And you know, not only are you never alone, but you, uh, you're always being reminded of your circumstance in life. So, you know, this world, this virtual world that makes it enables for those, for the people anywhere in the pyramid, but especially those who kind of don't have as much money, um, is, is the escape. And you know, you can you can you can be sitting in a room with a lot of people, kind of noise, noise, noise. But you can go into your phone, just like you see your kids in your video. But kids, you, see, you just use your kid. Kids gone because they're in the phone. They're in a whole new world. They they can be whoever they want to be. So they're not constricted by what people's expectations are in the real world. And they can distract themselves from what's going on. And it's fun. So it's absolutely addictive to the whole thing. And that for me, that was that was really cool. And that again kind of brings back to anonymity. Of course. Anonymity can only take you so far. So in this, in this country of Mexico, you can't engage in the economy without us knowing your identity because you can't get with it. Uh, so there's always going to be ways of getting back to who the person is. But you know, you can see that the only reason something like Mexico took off is because you gave people an absolutely friction-free way of getting in. So it was free, no matter what phone you had. And you didn't have to put in your personal details you know, and then get an advert for whatever it was that you want. So that was kind of all the kind of the secrets to the whole thing. I think for us going forward, uh, you know, we we see in the African context, it's quite a, quite a, it's a virgin territory. There's not a lot of competition. Um, uh, the big American companies like Facebook and uh, Google are starting to move in and all that stuff, and that's really why competition is down the line. We, uh, I mean, I take a view that companies are not just the product. I think there's more, uh, the DNA of the company is how it started, and that doesn't ever change, and that determines how long it will last. And the interesting thing about, unlike, say, something like Facebook, which started trying to embarrass people and started in Harvard and has screwed many people along the way, something like Mixit has, uh, I mean, started to help people. And it was actually started by our parents. Not many tech companies in the world are started by parents. Parents with kids who are like over the age of six, I think. Um, and they understand the dangers of technology for children, meeting strangers, and all of that stuff. So everything's kind of watched around that. But also understand the power that gives kids and how much autonomy it is. Um, it was, it's, uh, it started on mobile, just mobile. I mean, there is actually a, a PC client for Mac or PC in can download. It's pretty crap, actually. Huh? We're trying to fix a lot of the user experience on the nicer devices. But, but you know, it's available. But the, the thing is, the trick and the reason it works so nicely is that it started on mobile and on, on feature phones. 
And then, yeah, it started in like one of the poorest kind of crime ridden communities in the world, in Fairfax, and started right at the bottom. And um, it's kind of moving its way up the front. So, no, hopefully, we don't uh, make, a, make a mess of it. There's some extra books here if you'd like to read a little story about that whole thing. And uh, let me I'll just conclude with my normal life. So, it feels like I'm on a rocket and I'm uh, going to the moon, right? And it doesn't matter whether I reach the moon or blow up along the way, we'll be amongst the stars. Thank you very much. The, uh, there is the standard kind of thing, are you horrible and dirty? You've got a ticket. And then of course the kids can lie about that kind of thing. But I mean, I mean everybody in South Africa now knows that if you give your kid a phone, they can probably put mix it on this one. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff around that. There is actually a lot of IP around uh, educating parents and helping them feel comfortable around the kids using the something they should do. One of the most interesting things that we've come to realize is that you don't have to worry too much about kids in these situations because they very, very quickly will find out whether somebody coming into a chat room is not their age, etc. So, you know, you can think they can't, they can't, they can. And, and there's some like little shortcut commands that you can get inside chat rooms that expel people, basically red card certain users from the chat rooms that allow to come back. So, the community organizes itself. I mean, the customer care, it's a lot of people using the network. Uh, there's only seven customer care operators. The community itself formed the forums which manage all the issues around the factory or the Samsung uh, and then the run. And then the next staff actually only step in when there's a problem they can see there's something wrong with the report. But John, you know, one thing interesting is all of this was written in South Africa and it wouldn't cost a lot of that. And I think the total cost for the whole switch of channels is like 40 billion messages a month. I mean 40 billion is bigger is bigger than most what telcos do in terms of switching. Uh, it was all written in Salabash, I think the total cost was about uh, one and a half million dollars, and the total running costs, including salaries per year, is probably one and a half million dollars. So it's quite light. You know? So you don't have to go spend hundred million dollars to go. Um, yeah, that's great. Just quick. Um, you mentioned that thirty percent of your revenue comes from advertising, and much of the rest comes from content. Can you share a bit more about the kind of content that you deliver through Mixit and how, um, who, who's the content from? Okay, so the revenue model, just on advertising. Don't build a business on advertising. Okay. Unless you Google. You know, so, and I mean, at least in our context. We, we tried it, a uh, hundred business plan, we did so many of these little things. You know, we're going to make money advertising, the pie is getting bigger. Uh, it's a lot of crap. But you can't make money on advertising. Um, Mixer does make a lot of money from advertising, but it's an enormous audience. An enormous audience. And basically what it does is sell billboards. So you pay Mixer like $20,000 and they'll send a message to the whole base in the world. You know, everybody in the base will open a message saying, buy a few more insurance for um, Actually, the new revenue stream that's coming in now is research. So we do uh, something called Fun Green Panda, where we run surveys within Mixit, all opt-in, you don't pay for it, but people are looking for something to do. And actually, most of these people get, never get asked for their opinion on anything. So it's not called a survey, it's called we want your opinion, and you don't pay for it, and we have generally, we have, we have between 4,000 and 15,000 respondents within four hours on any survey of five questions. And now we've started doing surveys like, who do you think the president of South Africa should be, all that stuff. The newspapers are starting to write about that, and then food companies are coming to us saying, hey, can you do some surveys around the type of brands people are going for stuff? So that's, I think, a massive opportunity. A massive opportunity, because traditional research is not done real time, it's not done with such big sample sizes, and definitely doesn't get to that part of the frame. Around content, the biggest content category is games, uh, and that's chess. So we've got like half a million people who download the chess app, play the chess. Uh, the second biggest content category would be chat rooms. Um, then you've got music, there's like music thing. There's, a, there's a, actually a massive content category around uh, wallpapers, and it's a habit class basically. You know. What we'll do is we'll look at the network, you can see that just before a Manchester United game, which is a massive spike in people buying Manchester United papers. Um, and it's not after the game, it's before the game. So it doesn't matter if Man United wins or loses, but people want to tell their friends that they're a Man United supporter. So wallpapers are very big, and um, 
there is, there is a new kind of, I mean, there's some interesting things we're trying to experiment with. So in South Africa, we've got these big labor brushes who basically are the middleman between employers and unemployed. And their big problem is like they'll, they'll put an advert out saying, we're looking for uh, somebody with a matric, basically good at maths, want to get into a junior analyst position at a mining company. And uh, then they'll get like 150,000 CVs. So they can't match, like, there's no filters, and they've got to go through all those CVs. So we're doing some experiments with us now. So we, we'll segment our base. We'll say, like, how old do you want the person geographically? Where do you want the person to live, male, female? Okay, and um, well, why don't we just look at their, their chess average results? So we can see from the chess game whether you play chess well, which basically indicates you're good at maths and natural thinking and strategy and stuff. And start profiling people to their actually performance in games and things like that to help the labor brokers match jobs and stuff like that. So there's probably some interesting kind of business models that come out of that. As long as we're helping our audience, helping them out. When you can think about it and say, look, I'm helping the audience here, the citizens of the country, then we'll do something like that. But we don't necessarily want to, like, you know, you do your, all your friends to know that you just had a home pregnancy test before you want to tell your friends to bring it. Thank you. So we, um, our actual business model, our main business model is, will be setting up. So there's three things we, we've introduced into the content ecosystem. One is literacy. Free data literacy is massive, especially for our audience. And people find it very difficult to buy literacy. So you run out of literacy at 11 o'clock at night, and you're like, now what? You can't walk down the road to the sponsor shop. You can mix it now, you can buy your literacy for your local, for your local council. And we get about an 8% rebate on that. Um, the second thing is insurance. So it's actually one of the basic building blocks for the firm of moving up, is like having a safety net. You know? So don't build, build, build a medical emergency happens, something happens, and then you reset and you to start building again. So, and the major problem around that is uh, there's no real sashaying of insurance in South Africa. So breaking insurance down from one month uh, premium to a one daily premium, and a small premium, and of course billing. So getting, uh, getting money out of people who have credit cards. And then the, the major one is airtime. So, uh, so in South Africa, 90% of all phones are prepaid. Sub-Saharan Africa, 99% of phones are prepaid. And there's quite a lot of margin in there. I know price, uh, things are quite cheap in India for airtime and stuff, but in South Africa it's a little bit more expensive. But the nice thing about that is there's a lot of money in the distribution. So there's on average between 20 to 30% in the game if you sell prepaid airtime for the telcos, and we're gonna start selling airtime now. So our average user has about a $20 a month revenue per user, and we will probably retain 20%, percent um, And actually, when we moved into that game, the telco started seeing us as a friend, not as over-the-top enemy. You know. But the trick, of course, is don't do what Amazon does. And all of our deals, and the reason we're getting some making success with banks and telco and stuff is, what Amazon does is goes and goes to the publishers and says, dude, uh, you'll sell your books, and then passes all the discount into its audience and starts to price for it. And do that is the product. So you can't do that with the telco. You can never do that. You can never ever start a price with Patalka. Patalka gives you a Patalka. Patalka gives you a 2010 discount, you can't pass it to your customer. Because now you drop the price and there's a war in the distribution channels. You sell it at the same price Patalka told you to sell it at. And you provide value in other ways. And you pay for insurance for the person, or give them more games credits or things like that. But this is the, that is the main philosophical thing. It's a small thing, but it's a massive thing. Don't discount. So you mentioned prepaid electricity. Uh, that's a very unusual concept out here. It's all postpaid out here. So you have meters that actually know when to shut off. Yeah. So I think 90% of households in South Africa, every single household is electricity, and 90% are people. Oh. Yeah. And it's just it's real time, just switches off. And you can all tick it, red dot, electricity. Okay. And then you punch in a touch and then you get it. It's postpaid, and the idea of prepaid electricity wouldn't even yeah. make any sense yeah. out here. <laughs> well, it works very nice for high, so well, it's very good for the high income uh, communities as well, because you can control your stuff. So the municipalities around the world aren't necessarily known for efficiency. And uh, in South Africa, we have a lot of filling problems. You know, the council like, messes up the filling for the electricity. Then you've got to go through like two months of reconciliation with the council. So, so 
people are just encrypted just to know what they say. Obama, I watched at the beginning of the month, I'm sure I'm saying that doesn't stop. And obviously, anybody who's got a ring to attack anyone that just uses free credit. So that's very big stuff. Right? I mean, theft is the other big problem. There's, there's perceptions around one or two things like that, but the truth is it's not a, you know, not really, the biggest problem that exists in South Africa is it's very, very cheap. It's priced by the government, and it's less than the cost. So, you, know, you can't really have a private sector, no one will invest, you know, keep stuff so keep so. But I mean, there were some problems, you know, tech. The ANC has done an amazing job around providing basic services to everybody, and you know, just the last time. So in the last few years, it's now basically been worse. How do you think videos might do via something like Mixit? Um, so, for media, I think that my knee jerk is it's not going to work because it's um, probably related to this. But basically, all my knee jerks have been wrong. <laughs> we, we, published, we started publishing a very high end political analysis news site called the Daily Maverick, which is for all the decision makers, only the opinion makers and stuff who are really read. And we've, so we put it on Mixit and made it available. Because you know, you're on Mixit, you have no access to the internet. And so you can't actually get access to that news. But you think there's no interest in that, in that demographic or that type of news. But we've got twice the number of people subscribed to that news service on Mixit than they are actually reading it on the World Wide Web normally. In fact, we do syndicated news. So News24, which is the biggest news site in South Africa, which is all free news, on Mixit they charge for news. And they get a check of fifty thousand dollars a month on syndicated news content. The next game is the audience has no access to the free content, so this is interesting. Thing. I think I've been trying to get people to go do some video stuff, just to experiment, but you know, people are taking it away. Half the trick is kind of shining a light on what's possible, what's you know, it's worth an experiment, and making it easy within the app to use. Um, but I think uh, definitely the uh, audio streaming will be big. Like get it really live people at home, have you any of those types? said South Africa had 3G uh, from the start, so here, here it's more of 2G right now and 3G is still expensive relatively. So uh, how, how did the, like, the app adoption go? Like since everyone, was everyone using internet before the app or did people start getting data packages after because of Mixit? Um, I think the answer is Mixit and of course people get data packages. But look, 3G is expensive in South Africa. Well, it's getting cheaper and cheaper, but it's still very expensive. I mean, all of the pricing is very expensive. But the, uh, the fact that the network was enabled for that, and sort of optimized for that, and that, that you could download apps like Mixit, because half the problem is, like in America, you can't download Mixit. Because the networks have never ever optimized for, for, for these types of JGME apps to be downloaded. They went from really short phones, like analog, to hyper. So there was nothing in between they never had to optimize. So that's that is kind of what the what helped the PG stuff. Um, but the, the truth is, somebody explained this to me another day. Most of the content on the internet is developed for the West. And the West for the foreseeable future will always be ahead in terms of price and speed. So the content keeps keeping up with that, and you just can't keep up with it. In the South Africa, there's no way we're gonna have fiber do everybody's house. This is never gonna happen. No, not even any solid. It's just there are fewer fixed lines in South Africa today than there were in 1994. In 94 there were 4 million, now there are 2 million. So it's all going wireless. Africa's wireless. And then wireless will always suffer from price because it's privatized, and that's the only way it actually works because the wireless is not you know, running privately. And secondly, capacity. The air can only take so much, and it's always going to be less than fiber and uh, copper and all that stuff. So I think the truth is, make sure this Af content that was customized for the African context. So price and device capabilities. The more content you get for the local markets, enabling what technology is available, the better it will do. Because the American content doesn't take off because it's just too rich. And they kind of throw away all the old content because they think people don't want that content anymore. But the truth is that, I mean, I think 1990 kind of games, like games like Sockwork and Dungeons and Dragons, although that was a real world game, 
Those games are more relevant to our market now than anything else, much more relevant than World of Warcraft. So it's probably a little bit of a go back to the 80s and 90s that we wish. Okay, well, thanks very much for having the time to see you. And uh, good luck with all your stuff. Thanks, everyone. Um,